All right. I'm Chris with Tampa Hillsborough County Public Library. And before I introduce our presenter, I just want to let you know that this is the Robert, the program, Robert W. Saunders, Courage and Sacrifice in the Midst of Jim Crow. This is part of our Black History Month celebration. All month long, uh, we honor and recognize uh, the diverse and rich history of African Americans. And this program is part of that celebration. Uh, to learn more about what the library is doing and about our programs and some resources that you can find there, go to our landing page at hcplc.org slash, slash Black History Month. Pardon me. All right. And lastly, we want to just give a book shout out from our collection. This is Bridging the Gap, Continuing the Florida NAACP Legacy of Harry T. Moore. And it's written by Robert W. Saunders Sr. You can find out how to check out this book in our catalog at hcplc.org slash books. So I invite you to look at that. And there's a lot more, a lot more books on this topic in our collection. All right. So now I'm going to now introduce our guest presenter, Mr. Fred Hearns. He's the curator of Black History with Tampa Bay History Center. We're very grateful and honored to have him with us this evening. Hello, Fred, how are you? Hello, Chris, how are you today? I'm great, thank you for being with us today. We're really looking forward to this presentation and I'm going to now turn my camera and microphone off, but I will be here in the background if you need me, okay? Okay. Well, let's get started with uh, something that I've really been looking forward to. I want to thank the Hillsborough County Public Libraries for inviting me to talk about my friend, one of my mentors, someone who I greatly admired and who I learned so much from, Mr. Robert W. Bob Saunders. I'm honored to have this opportunity and I'm especially happy, I believe, Bobby Saunders Jr. might be on the call this evening, I understand. Uh, so if you're there, Bobby, uh, this this is uh, a tribute to your father. Uh, I hope that I present some information uh, that the community may not have been aware of, but you and many others are aware of some of the things that Bob Saunders did uh, very quietly and very effectively. Uh, Bob Saunders uh, was born in Tampa, Florida, uh, 1921, to William and Christina Rogers Saunders. And both his father and his mother had their roots in the Bahamas. And uh, like many Black people who came to Florida from the Caribbean islands, uh, they eventually settled in Tampa uh, like many of the Cubans who came here uh, because of the cigar industry, uh, that's also the industry that lured uh, his family here initially. Let me just say this about Bob Saunders too, because this is just this is more than just an academic exercise for me. Uh, I, I'm very pleased to, to say that I knew Bob Saunders. Uh, and we had some things in common, even though he was older than I was. Uh, his brother, Dr. Norman Jackson, and my father, Sam Hearns, were best friends. Uh, they actually played basketball together at Don Thompson High School in Tampa. That was the black high school that took in a lot of the veterans, African-American veterans who had not graduated from high school when they went off to World War II. And when they returned to Tampa, many of them attended Don Thompson High School where they learned trades and where they were able to graduate from high school, get a high school diploma. And in the case of Bob Saunders' older brother, Norman, and uh, my dad, I'm sorry, his younger brother, Norman, and uh, my dad, they were able to uh, attend college on basketball scholarships. So Norman Jackson was Bob Saunders' younger brother uh, who also blazed his own trail fighting for civil rights uh, for others. Uh, Bob grew up in the African Methodist Episcopal Church, the AME Church. Uh, 
like myself, uh, he was an AME for those formative years growing up and being a member of St. Paul AME Church also afforded him the opportunity to be exposed to some of the great leaders uh, of the African-American uh, struggle for justice. And that struggle continues today. But as a boy, Bob wrote in uh, this, this wonderful book that I hope many of you've had an opportunity to read, Bridging the Gap. Uh, he wrote about sitting up in the balcony at St. Paul AME Church and listening to some of these great speakers, uh, leaders who were uh, doing things that took a lot of courage to do. When you speak out against injustice, you automatically become a target to people who want to maintain the status quo. But there were a lot of brave, inspirational leaders who came through St. Paul AME Church. Uh, as a young man also, Bob, for a time, was a newspaper journalist, uh, writing first for the Florida Sentinel Bulletin. And then later on, he uh, followed his career as a journalist in Cincinnati, in Detroit. And uh, every job that he had helped him to develop skills that made him more and more effective working as he did for many years of his life for the NAACP. And I'll get back to the NAACP in just a moment. Uh, speaking of Bob's relatives, I have to mention a cousin of his uh, who also was a trailblazer, Teresa Manuel, who was the first African-American woman from this area uh, I believe from Florida to participate in the Olympics. Uh, Teresa Manuel attended Tuskegee Institute in Tuskegee, Alabama after graduating from Middleton High School in Tampa and set all kinds of records there. She scored 57 points in a basketball game. I think that record may still stand, uh, but her best sport was track, which she didn't even participate in in high school. But she had an opportunity to go to the Olympics in 1948, representing the United States. Uh, and so uh, she also was an outstanding individual. And as I mentioned, uh, she was a cousin of Bob Saunders. So Bob's parents, after they married in 1919, two years later, Bob was born. Uh, he grew up in Tampa in uh, an area known then as Robert City. And my God, if Bob could see Robert City today, he wouldn't recognize his old neighborhood with all the growth that's taken place. And uh, the Tampa Heights area uh, between Waterworks Park and Palm Avenue uh, near the Hillsborough River, that's where Bob grew up. That was Robert City. We have only a few reminders of Robert City around today. There is a historic marker in Julian B. Lane Riverfront Park that gives a little of the history of Robert City. But I'll just say this about Robert City. It was a, a place that was quite different from most of the Deep South, where you had Blacks and Italians and Sicilians and Cubans living right next to each other uh, in that area. You didn't find that in many Southern cities, but it did happen in Robert City. And that's where Bob grew up. He said he learned early that it's a valuable thing to be a part of a group that has a purpose. It has a, a good pur purpose and a positive purpose. And he learned that when he was a member of the Boy Scouts. And he remembered that because when he decided to cast his lot with the NAACP, he knew that it was going to be a, a challenge. He knew it was going to be difficult, but he knew that he was part of a strong organization and he would not be by himself. He would not be alone. And that gave him a lot of strength during the times when, in some cases, he had to fear for his life when he was 
only trying to register people to vote. If you can imagine today how many people and organizations and churches have voter registration drives and, and you see people going around getting people to sign up to register to vote. Well, when Bob was doing that kind of work, you could lose your life just by trying to get people to register to vote. Black people uh, who had not been registered, who had not been voting, and there were a lot of folk who wanted to keep things that way. So as a young man, again, as Bob was growing up in Tampa, he attended Middleton High School at a time when Middleton burned down. This was not the first time that there had been a fire at Middleton, and it wouldn't be the last. The school was burned three times, uh, 1938, began in 1940, and then 1967, 68. So we see that there was actually a pattern of schools being burned in the South. St. Peter Claver Catholic School was burned in 1894, not very far from the St. Paul AME Church that Bob would later attend. St. Benedict the Moor, a Catholic school on Columbus Drive and 20th Street was burned around 1950. And again, Tampa was not the only place where this was happening. So Bob witnessed these things as he was growing up. And uh, let's go to another slide. We see his mother there in that bottom photo and his parents in the top photo. Next slide, please. This is a young man who Bob became very friendly with uh, at a time when this young man that we're looking at was perhaps the most courageous man who's ever lived in the state of Florida. This is Harry T. Moore. Harry T. Moore lived in Mims, Florida. And for several years, he was the field secretary for the NAACP, the very first person to hold that position. Harry T. Moore traveled throughout the state of Florida, again, registering people to vote, but also fighting racism and prejudice and discrimination wherever he found it. And he challenged uh, law enforcement officers. He did some things that some folk in the, in the NAACP thought that, that he should not be doing, that he was really going a little too far. And on Christmas night in 1951, when Harry and Harriet Moore were celebrating their wedding anniversary. They went to bed that night and they never woke up the next morning because the Ku Klux Klan, it was uh, suspected. There was never any real investigation, so no one was ever arrested. But we can pretty well assume that it was the KKK that put dynamite under his bedroom and when the dynamite exploded, Harry was killed instantly. His wife died soon afterwards. They also had two daughters and one of the daughters was home when the explosion happened. She died some, some time later and the other daughter who happened to be away was on her way to Mims to celebrate the holidays with her parents. And when she arrived there on the train, she found the results of this explosion at their home. Quite sad. I did meet Evangeline Moore a few years ago when she visited Tampa, uh, the only surviving daughter of Harry T. Moore. So when Harry T. Moore was killed, again, Christmas night, 1951, that left a void in leadership in the state of Florida in the NAACP. Let's go to the next slide, please. These are the conditions, again, in the 1940s, 1950s, at the time when Bob was growing up. You see the colored only sign there on the left. To the right is another area where Black people were restricted to during the days of segregation. There were 
colored and black signs, Negro signs all over. And even when there were not signs, black people knew where they could go and where they were not wanted. And very few people challenged this system in the 1940s. That didn't happen a lot in Tampa. And even in the 1950s, there were not a lot of folk who challenged racism head on. It was dangerous work. And it was work that took people with extraordinary courage. In the bottom photo there, you see Bob Saunders' mother, Christina, and that's the Robert City neighborhood that Bob grew up in, in the background. Let's go to the next slide. Here we see some children with basketballs and they're standing looking through a chain link fence. I remember that fence. I remember those buildings in the background. They're sort of faint, but you can just make out their buildings behind those children. They're standing in the College Hill public housing area of East Tampa, where there was no basketball court at the time this photo was taken. There was no playground in College Hill when this photo was taken. What they're looking at is a basketball court and a playground on the other side of the fence in the public housing that was known as Ponce de Leon public housing. It was built in the 1950s for Latin families, L-A-T-I-N, meaning Hispanic families, Cubans, Sicilians, Italians, not for blacks, not for whites. Believe it or not, there was a division in public housing for Caucasians or whites and for Latins, even Latins who had fair skin. So they're looking at the Latin section of public housing in Ponce de Leon, where they were not allowed to go and play, nor live. So all of the apartments behind those children were occupied by Blacks living in College Hill, College Hill Public Housing. And Bob Saunders is probably the one who took this photograph. Uh, he took a lot of photographs of injustice throughout the years that he not only lived in Tampa, but when he traveled all over the state of Florida. This is one of the photos and all of these photos for that fact were taken from his book, Bridging the Gap. Let's go to the next slide, please. So here we have this young man, again, who after he finished high school, went to Bethune-Cookman College in Daytona Beach, where he had a partial scholarship. And of course, he worked. And while he was at Bethune-Cookman, he got to know Mrs. Bethune quite well. He actually worked in her home for a while. That was part of the uh, job that he had when he was a student, washing dishes. And he said that uh, one of the young men who he often washed dishes with was a young man from Tampa known as E.L. Bing. And Mr. Bing went on to have a distinguished career in government, county government in Hillsborough County. But Bob, uh, after he left Bethune-Cookman, he was drafted into the army. Of course, World War II was taking place in the early 1940s. He wound up at Tuskegee Airfield in Tuskegee, Alabama. When he got discharged, he came back to Tampa for a while, trying to decide what he was going to do. And he wasn't here very long when he made up his mind that if he was going to advance as, as a journalist, or in some other field, uh, he had uh, ambitions to go beyond what Tampa had to offer at that time uh, in the segregated South. And so he decided to go north to Cincinnati and then Detroit. And it was in Detroit while he was a law student at the Detroit Institute of Technology studying law with plans to become an attorney. That's when we found out again on Christmas night, 1951, that Harry T. Moore, his wife and his, and his daughter 
lost their lives. And so the NAACP was without a law, without a leader in Florida, without a field secretary. And up steps Bob Saunders to fill that position a few months later. And I've asked myself many times, would I have had the courage to take a job where my predecessor had been assassinated just for doing his job, just for fighting injustice? I don't know if I would have had the courage that Bob Saunders had. Let's go to the next slide, please. And here we have some other photos of what we had to face at that time in Florida. Uh, the, the photo top left was taken in Tampa at the F.W. Woolworth department store at the lunch counter. In February of 1960, several students from, Hills, from, uh, from Hillsborough County, they were students at Blake High School, Middleton High School, Booker T. Washington Junior High School, who staged a sit-in led by Clarence Fort. After several months, the lunch counters were desegregated without very much violence in Tampa, although there was a lot of violence in other places. The top right photo is of a wade-in that took place in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, in Broward County, where again, the beaches, believe it or not, in Florida is surrounded by beaches on the peninsula, and all of the beaches were segregated for many, many years. But in the early 1960s, we find young people primarily challenging this system of racism, and the NAACP monitored a lot of this activity and went to court representing black people who were trying to desegregate uh, different venues in the state of Florida. Uh, below the photo of the young people at the beach, uh, we see a colored sign, one of the typical signs we would find in train stations where there were Negro waiting rooms and white waiting rooms. And there usually were no Negro cafeterias or restaurants. I can remember many years traveling up to New York from Tampa and uh, carrying on the train and carrying a brown paper bag that my mother and my grandmother used to prepare for me with fried chicken and pound cake. And that would be my lunch because there were very few places Black people, even if you had the money to do so, could stop and go into a restaurant uh, at the stops uh, when you're taking the train. So we took our lunch with us on, on most occasions. Bottom left, you see a cross burning. And that photo was taken in Tallahassee. It could have been taken many other places in the South where we know the Klan was active and burning crosses is something that they had done uh, since 1915 when the film, The Birth of a Nation came out. And that's where that idea of burning crosses uh, first became popular. Let's go to the next slide, please. Everyone should recognize the man in the center. That's the late President John F. Kennedy. This picture was taken in the White House in 1962. And President Kennedy is surrounded by some 60 civil rights workers, most of them affiliated with the NAACP. And there you see Bob Saunders. Uh, he's the man, as you look at this picture, uh, where President Kennedy has his arms sort of stretched out there. That's Bob Saunders just to the right of President Kennedy. As you're looking at it, it's to President Kennedy's left. Bob has on the white shirt and tie with glasses, looking right into the camera uh, with the curtain right behind him. So this was one of the meetings that the NAACP had with President Kennedy to encourage him to sign a civil rights bill, to, to pass legislation, get it through Congress. And of course, two years later, we did get the 1964 Civil Rights Act. 
Bob had a hand in helping to push that legislation forward. Let's go to the next slide. This is a picture of Bob at his home during the time probably that he was writing the book, Bridging the Gap. You see some of his awards on the wall there behind him. Uh, I also need to mention uh, Bob's wife, Helen Saunders, who at one time was president of the Tampa branch of the NAACP, uh, stood by his side for many, many years. Uh, as I mentioned before, Bobby Jr. Uh, was their son. And even Bobby had a hand in moving Tampa forward when in 1962, uh, he enrolled as a student at McFarland Park Elementary School. The public schools in 1962 was still segregated, but Bob Saunders, along with Reverend A. Leon Lowry uh, and a few other brave parents had their children enroll in all white schools and gradually began to break down segregation in public schools, which uh, actually lasted until 1971, when all of the schools were desegregated. So just a few more words, and then we'll enter into uh, some dialogue. Uh, Bob, uh, again, had some excellent role models, beginning with his grandmother, who in 1915, was one of the original organizers of a uh, local NAACP. Uh, the local is one step before you organize a branch. So the NAACP branch was organized in Tampa in 1917. But two years before that, uh, some citizens were able to organize a local and the national NAACP had recommended that as a first step. And eventually Tampa had uh, the second largest NAACP branch uh, next to Jacksonville and, and, and then Atlanta uh, in the South. Uh, over 100 people joined the NAACP in Tampa in 1917. And the following year, another 50 some people joined the Tampa branch of the NAACP under the leadership of James Weldon Johnson, the Jacksonville native who, along with his brother Rosamond, gave us Lift Every Voice and Sing, the Negro National Anthem, which I'm sure many of you have heard before, and you'll probably hear it uh, again more this month, Black History Month. I was very pleased to hear it before the Super Bowl on Sunday evening also. And that song was written by two Floridians, James Weldon Johnson, who organized the Tampa branch of the NAACP, and his brother Rosamond. So looking at the life of Bob Saunders, uh, it, it just seemed natural and the right thing to do to give him all the honors we could when we had that opportunity. And so in 2003, Bob was injured in an automobile accident. Uh, he was unconscious for quite some time. And when he passed that year, it didn't take very long for Hillsborough County government to honor him in, I, in what I thought was the most appropriate way by naming the former Ybor City Public Library, the Robert W. Saunders, Public Library, 1505 North Nebraska Avenue. Some of us who know the history of that library know that it actually began in 1933 in the Italian Club on 7th Avenue in Ybor City. And then later on, that library moved uh, into a new building, the Ybor City Public Library at 1505 North Nebraska in 1969. And after Bob's death, when the library was named for him, uh, that brought so many people together to form uh, the Ada T. Payne 
friends of the urban libraries. Ada T. Payne was a librarian who I'm sure Bob knew. She was a librarian for many years on Central Avenue at the Harlem Branch Public Library. And also the Robert W. Saunders Library Foundation was formed after Bob's death. And through the foundation, we were able to bring Julian Bond to Tampa to speak at a fundraiser. And many of the proceeds from that fundraiser went toward purchasing a bronze bust of Bob Saunders. And when you enter the doors of the Bob Saunders Library on Nebraska Avenue, one of the first things you see is that bronze bust. And we thank Julian Bond for that and all the other supporters who came together and uh, helped to donate funds to purchase that bus through the Bob Saunders Library Foundation. And so those of us who knew Bob can count ourselves fortunate. I never saw this man lose his temper. I never heard him swear. I never saw him lose his cool. I'm sure there were times when that may have happened, but I never saw it. And what really made me fall in love with local history, the way that I love it now, was when Bob Saunders published his book in the year 2000. And I actually was able to go to the University of Tampa at the initial book signing, and I got one of his autographed books that night. And that really began to push me in the direction. I could never be what Bob Saunders was to this city, but it did begin to push me in the direction to want to learn more and more local history and try to make a difference in Tampa in any way that I could. And so I'm honored this evening as I conclude my remarks to just give you a little bit of information about this man this great man who we have a public library today, some 26,000 square feet named in his honor with an African-American research library. Of course, uh, the largest auditorium of any public library in Hillsborough County uh, that we were so pleased to play a, a, a role in bringing about to serve the citizens of Hillsborough County and beyond. So let's go to the next slide. I believe we have one more. And again, all of the images that you've seen during this presentation come from Bob's book, Bridging the Gap, Continuing the Florida NAACP Legacy of Harry T. Moore, written by Bob Saunders and published in the year 2000. And we'll now entertain questions and we'll try to provide answers to those. And you see my contact information at the bottom of the screen. I'm the Black History Curator at the Tampa Bay History Center. My name is Fred Hearns and Chris, I'll turn it over to you now. All right. Thank you so much, Fred. That was a very interesting and uh, important presentation. Thank you for doing that. Like uh, Fred mentioned, it's now time for the Q&A portion. Um, if you're watching on the computer, there's a question section in the control panel you can post there. And again, if you're watching on a tablet or a phone, just tap the question mark icon and you can submit that way. All right. It looks like we do have some questions coming in here. Um, someone is asking, um, in referencing the uh, how uh, Mr. Saunders, as a young person, went to the St. Paul's AME Church to see um, leaders and speakers and how that helped shape him. They're asking, um, how did spir his spirituality play a role in his adult life and in his work? Well, as I mentioned, Bob was a member of the AME Church. And uh, of course, being a churchman and a leader in his church, as well as in the community, uh, he's a man who lived by faith. There's no way he could have done what he did had he not had faith in a higher power. And so believing in God and believing that uh, 
we get strength from him when we lean on him and lean not upon our own understanding. Uh, Bob was a very humble guy. And as I said before, very soft spoken. When he walked in a room, uh, you knew he was there, but he never threw his weight around. He never tried to bully people. Uh, I, be I believe that came from some of the lessons he learned in Sunday school. Some of the same lessons that many of us learned in Sunday school. And then growing up as a Boy Scout. I mean, that contributed, I think, also to uh, the faith and the strength. I call it quiet strength uh, that he had. I think that's, that's how Tony Dungy refers to it, that quiet strength, you know. It's not always the one who makes the most noise or who's uh, the most boisterous that that wins. Uh, it's often the one who, uh, you know, uses uh, the talent that they've been given, but in an humble way and not to try to push people around, try to reason with people and have faith in God. I mean, I remember reading some of the minutes from the Tampa Housing Authority board meetings when uh, the board was all white at one time. And uh, not that that's a bad thing, but these were people who in many cases were not sensitive to the needs of black people and who were determined to keep the public housing areas that they had jurisdiction over segregated where black people were assigned to black projects and white people were assigned to white projects. And as I said before, Latin people were assigned to Latin projects. Didn't make any sense at all. And uh, I, I remember reading that Bob uh, Gilder and Bob Saunders went to a uh, Tampa Housing Authority board meeting and the uh, chairman of the board at that time kept calling black people Negroes. And the Negroes did this and the Negroes did that. And Bob said, excuse me, sir, but would you put an O in that word and, and call it Negroes? And there was a confrontation where the chairman said, well, you don't tell me how to speak. But you know what, uh, Bob took, I mean, that's just one little example of an indignity that he had to withstand. But again, he never lost his cool. So it had to be the spiritual uh, motor inside of him that he had from being a young man and learning that, you know, you don't have to yell and scream to win. Uh, so he, he was a man of strong faith and he walked it and he talked it and he lived it every day. All right. We have a few questions coming in uh, in reference to uh, Harry T. Moore. Um, I guess a little bit of what you're talking about here, how, in terms of being uh, the field director for the NAACP, how was uh, Mr. Um, Saunders different or similar to, to Harry T. Moore? Well, Bob, uh, because of his personality, I guess, and, and uh, again, he, was, uh, he had that quiet strength. One of the things that he was told, though, when he took the job, by Ed Davis and some other NAACP leaders was try to stay out of those little towns. You know, there are a lot of small towns in rural Florida, especially when you get up near the panhandle. And even though he visited those small towns when he was organizing and trying to get people to join the NAACP and become registered voters, uh, he had to use a lot of wisdom when he did that. And, Many times when he would travel, and, and I don't think Harry T. Moore necessarily did this, uh, Bob would take other people with him who knew the area that he was going into. So if he was going to a little town up in the Panhound that he'd never been to before, uh, one of the people who would help him, advise him, and even recommend other people to go with him was Perry Harvey. Bob's office for uh, many years was in the same building that Perry Harvey's office was in, uh, the president of the Longshoremen Association. And there were longshoremen from all over Florida who worked on the docks here in Tampa. So there was usually somebody Perry Harvey knew who was familiar with anywhere that Bob was going. And Bob would often travel with these folk or he'd ask them, who do I see when I get there? And 
who can I trust and where should I stay away from? So he took a lot of that kind of advice and he took precautions that uh, perhaps Harry T. Moore didn't take and not because uh, Harry didn't know better, but Harry T. Moore, and I never knew Harry T. Moore. All I know about him is what I read and, and some of the things that I heard. But uh, he put the he put the capital B in brave. I mean, he challenged racist sheriffs and he challenged people who you know had a reputation of uh, of violence. And he didn't care. He just did what he felt he needed to do, and you know he became a martyr. And one of the things that I want to do again is is to help spread the word that we need to do more to honor Harry T. Moore. And that's why Bob did what he did in his book, continuing the legacy. Bob knew what Harry T. Moore meant to the state of Florida and to all of us. So uh, that's a long answer to the question, but I think he used what uh, we call mother wit, common sense. He didn't take unnecessary chances. He took people with him who knew the territory if he was going to a place he wasn't familiar with. And his office was here in Tampa where he felt relatively safe because he grew up here and he knew uh, the area and he knew you know, what, what he could do and what it didn't make much sense to try to do. And thank God we had him with us for, for many, many years. All right. Uh, the next question, you were touching on it a little bit there. Um, someone's asking, how can we continue Moore's legacy given the attacks on Black history today? Join the NAACP. Make sure you vote and make sure everyone you have influence over votes. If you're a member of a church or a civic organization or fraternity or sorority, or any other, any other organization that has voter registration drives, get involved or help start one if you can. Uh, stay informed. Uh, make sure that whenever something is going on that affects your community or community where uh, you have connections, uh, you know, one of the things that I used to love to do every morning was read the newspaper. And of course, uh, we don't have a daily print newspaper every day now in Tampa. It's online, but uh, try to read the news and, and stay involved and stay informed. And you can make a difference in so many ways. You know, uh, I, I decided a few years ago that I would throw all my eggs in the history basket. And again, learn as much local history as I could try to read everything I could get my hands on about Tampa history, uh, share that with young people, with other folk who are interested in knowing the history of this area. Uh, we can learn so much from history. There's, there's very little that's new under the sun. You probably heard that expression before, it's true. It may have a different name, it may have a different outer cloak, but basically, you know, history has a way of repeating itself. So if we become knowledgeable and we read and, and books like Bob's book, read those books, learn from those books, and that will help us prepare for the future and try to leave tomorrow a better place for our children uh, than, than we found. And that's what Bob did. He left this place much better for Bobby Jr. and for other young people than the way it was when he found it. Great leadership, sacrifice, and determination. All right, so we've got some more questions. Um, someone's asking uh, about his journalism career and what uh, periodicals or publications or newspapers that he wrote for. Well, from what I gather, he started with the Florida Sentinel Bulletin. The Florida Sentinel Bulletin uh, was, it was actually the Tampa Bulletin from 1915 to 1945, owned by Reverend Marcellus Potter and his wife, Mary. They were the publishers of the Tampa Bulletin. 
So he began with the Tampa Bulletin, and then in 1945, I think it was December, that's when C. Blythe Andrews purchased the Tampa Bulletin, and it became the Florida Sentinel Bulletin. But Bob wrote for the Tampa Bulletin. Uh, again, he wrote for newspapers in Cincinnati and in Detroit. And uh, I'm not sure if he wrote any book before Bridging the Gap. I think that was the first book that he ever published. But I'm sure he wrote editorials and uh, he covered local news. Uh, he, he really thought he was going to be a journalist. That's the way he was headed. And uh, then he decided he'd go to law school. And all of that training helped him because uh, when he had to write uh, letters to elected officials or to other people, you know, uh, he, he was a writer. He had, he had that natural ability. And so he was able to express himself in writing as well as verbally, you know, very well. And working for the NAACP where most of the people who did that kind of work were volunteers, it was important to have someone who had professional writing ability uh, sort of steering the ship as he did when he was in Tampa. He was head of the Florida NAACP uh, from 1952 to 1966. And so those 14 years, he must have written hundreds and hundreds of letters uh, and other communications. So uh, we do know that he did at, some, at one point write for newspapers in Tampa, in Cincinnati, and Detroit. And I'll, we'll mention uh, another one of our library branches, the C. Blythe Andrews uh, Junior Public Library, um, has a microfilm collection of the, uh, the Sun Sentinel Bulletin. So if you're interested in doing some research, you can visit that location as well. Um, all right, so moving on, we have some more questions here. Uh, someone's asking about his military service. What branch of the military did he serve in? He was in the Army. Okay. and. Uh, this was a little interesting too, because he was in the army, but he was stationed at Tuskegee. He was not a Tuskegee Airman. Uh, he that was that would have been his desire because even as a boy, he he wrote about his love for model airplanes. He used to like to put model airplanes together, and he dreamed of flying one day. Uh, but for some reason, that didn't happen. So he. Uh, I believe I, I'm not, I don't want to guess at his rank when he was discharged, but he was in the military for about a couple of years. And uh, when he got his discharge, again, he came back to Tampa. Uh, but he never uh, was in uh, any, any battle on the battlefield while he was stationed in the Army. Uh, I don't recall it, re ever reading about him going overseas and actually, you know, during World War II, being in, uh, in any action. Uh, he was stationed state, stateside, as far as I know. All right, thank you. We have a few more questions. Uh, someone's asking about, uh, I guess it's a two-part question here, about Robert City that you mentioned. Where did you say the historic marker was again? Is that where, if someone wanted to go see it? Where yeah, I, and, I, and I do encourage people to do that. It's actually inside the park, Junior B. Lane, Riverfront Park. There are two historic markers inside that park. One of them is for Robert City, and it gives you a little information about, you know, the area where actually the marker is in Robert City. And the other marker gives you information about Phillips Field, which was a football stadium that the University of Tampa played all of their college football games in. That's also where Middleton and Blake High School played their home games. And that's also where Floyd a &M University, Bethune, Cookman, several other black colleges played football games. And even the University of Florida, the Florida Gators played there uh, at one time, as did uh, Florida State when they began playing football and the University of Miami. So all of the 
colleges pretty much in the state of Florida, one time or the other, played football games right there in Robert City in Phillips Field in the football stadium that, mm -hmm. of course, is no longer there. So the, the, the marker that talks about Phillips Field is maybe 20 yards away from the one that talks about Robert City. So they're actually right in the middle of the park along the sidewalk. Okay. All right. Looks like, like I said, we have another question about Robert City. Um, you mentioned when he grew up there um, that it was a diverse community. There were um, Italians and, and Cuban uh, populations. Was he able to um, develop or sustain uh, any sort of ties or connections to those local populations, the diverse populations of Tampa? I'm sure he had friends as an adult uh, of people from other nationalities who grew up in Robert City. I'm, I'm pretty sure of that. Because as children, they played together. They couldn't go to school together. They couldn't you know, do a lot of other things together. Uh, if their skin was white, they could go in restaurants and do things he couldn't do. But as children, you know, they played together and he, he had friends. Uh, and I'm sure that, again, some of those friendships uh, followed through into adulthood. You know, you don't stop being friends with somebody that you grew up with uh, if, you, if that's really a friend of yours uh, once you're an adult. So I'm sure he had friends going back to that old neighborhood. All right. Give it a few more seconds here. If you want to post any more questions, please share them now. Um, again, thank you so much, Fred. This was a really great presentation, a lot of useful information, and just, you know, like you said, history is, uh, is very important. It tells us how we got to where we are today. And uh, Mr. Saunders was an amazing, outstanding leader and a fine example for, for all of us. And we appreciate you doing this presentation. It looks like that's all we have for our questions. So I am going to move on now to our closing slide. If anyone wants to contact the library, you can call us at 813-273-3652 or go online at hcplc.org slash contact. Also, I mentioned our Black History Month landing page. Um, that's at hcplc.org slash Black History Month. I invite you to go there, find out about some of our other programs and resources that we have. And lastly, you can also go on our website and share how the library has touched you at hcplc.org slash stories. We'd like to hear how we've impacted your life and you can share with us there. All right, with that, I'm going to say thank you again to you, Mr. Hearns. It was an honor and very grateful for your time. And I thank everyone who joined us. And I hope you all have a great evening. Thank you and good night. Thank you so much. Happy Black History Month. Yes. Thank you, Fred. Good night. Good night.